Uh, oh, I don't have to pay attention to this anymore. Uh, I'm Dan Rosenberg. Um, I'm a historian from the University of Oregon. Um, delighted to be here. Uh, it's weird to be here. I, I have to say, um, you know, the, the, the people who I, who I write about mostly are very, very dead. Um, and it's not the case today, delightfully. Um, so, um, so let me begin with this uh, caveat. Uh, as a historian, I uh, am not an expert in computers. Um, as a historian principally of the 18th century, I don't even spend most of my time thinking about uh, what happened during the most recent 300 years. Uh, and some of the history uh, I will be talking about today, well, I was going to say some of this history is going to be very old, but after uh, Frodo's talk, uh, it'll all seem extremely modern. Um, okay, on the other hand, uh, as an interloper here, I hope that I bring something useful, uh, at least in part authorized by Ted's own notion of systems humanism. I want to suggest that Ted's work can be a tool for humanists. I want to suggest further that it may be as significant a guide to the universe of paper as it is to that of the screen. So uh, before I plunge into history before our time, and fair warning, that's where I'm headed, uh, I want to very briefly uh, uh, recount my own first encounter with Ted's work. Uh, the year was 1997. It was an eventful time for computers and the internet, as Wendy has suggested. Uh, I had just finished grad school at UC Berkeley, and I had relocated to the very abstract environment of Irvine, California, just a few miles from here, where I was in a, uh, where I had a postdoc in a study group investigating what we called histories of the future. And I must say, it was hard not to feel that we had found just the right place for our research headquarters here in Orange County. We were apparently not the first to think this. Uh, we were more than a little fascinated to learn that our office building on the UC Irvine campus had previously been used in the filming of the conquest of the Planet of the Apes in 1972. So the cover for our book, uh, for it, we used a photo from uh, the University of California Irvine archives showing the movie extras heading off to lunch. My intention uh, that postdoctoral year was to write about the future dreams of the 18th century encyclopedists, one of the subjects of my dissertation. And it remained my intention right up until I encountered Ted's work for the first time uh, which introduced me to another garden of forking paths. <laughs> In the 1990s, of course, uh, there was a lot of talk about how the world was changing with the advent of new information technologies uh, in general and with the web in particular. And I'm sure we all uh, remember the overheated rhetoric of that moment. Uh, not that moment. Um, but the curious thing about my own experience uh, of those new technologies was that they didn't feel very novel, uh, neither in their successes, nor in their limitations, nor in the hyperbolic rhetoric around them. To the contrary, what captured my imagination coming from the world of the 18th century was its visceral familiarity all of which uh, was confusing, uh, confusing, that is, until I discovered literary machines. So here is an iconic image from Ted's work. Uh, its caption, everything is deeply intertwingled, of course, is our fulcrum today. Uh, and here is something that Ted says about it and other diagrams like it. Within bodies of writing everywhere, there are linkages that we tend not to see. The individual document at hand is what we deal with. We do not see the total linked co connection of them, collection of them all at once, but they are there, the documents not present as well as those that are, and the, the grand cat's cradle among them all. What Ted expresses in this eloquent passage resonates strongly 
with what the Enlightenment philosophers understood the world of paper texts to be like. And it resonates still more strongly with what they argued it should be like. The philosophers of the Enlightenment understood the problem of knowledge as both a matter of seeing the world in a certain way and also of operationalizing that vision through technical mechanisms. During the 18th century, these ran on the platform of print. Thus, the 18th century produced dozens of new encyclopedias, dictionaries, concordances, atlases, and other interconnecting nonlinear and non-hierarchical information tools, many of which you are certainly familiar with. Among the 18th century works to really engage the intertwingling problem in a robust way, the most ambitious and the most thoroughly theorized was certainly the Encyclopédie, published by the French philosopher Denis Diderot and the mathematician Jean Laurent d'Alembert between 1751 and 1772. The Encyclopédia of Diderot and d'Alembert was remarkable in every way. It was brilliant, employing the labors of the best writers of the day, including luminaries such as Voltaire and Rousseau. It was enormous, comprising 28 volumes, 72,000 articles by over 2,000 writers, and more than 3,000 plates. And it was formally rigorous, employing several very intuitive systems of reference and cross-reference, making it as accessible as it was sophisticated. It was also, by the way, a great uh, gesture of, of free thinking, and for this it was censored. The reference systems embedded in the work were no mere convenience. Quite the opposite, Diderot and D'Alembert believed that the encyclopedia offered a response to a brewing crisis in the general field of information. Among other challenges, there was a widespread perception of information explosion. The 18th century world was awash in newspapers, journals, letters, bureaucratic documents, and books. So many books that contemporaries despaired at the prospect of mastering them all. In order to perceive the very visceral dimension of this problem, you have to understand that until the end of the 17th century, scholars continued to maintain the fiction that a polymath should master all of the important literature much as until very recently, we still imagined that a brick and mortar library could effectively serve our information needs. Today's information vertigo is really quite parallel to that of the 18th century. Every period feels that it overloads something. The 18th century blew out the individual human memory and in a flash replaced it with the reference wall that we've only just seen dismantled. As print flourished in the 18th century, the Renaissance ideal seemed farther and farther distant. And without some sort of fix, Diderot and D'Alembert argued, books would pile up until, in their words, it will be almost as convenient to search for some bit of truth concealed in nature as it will be to find it hidden away in an immense multitude of bound volumes. So what were the innovations? First, Borrowing from the format of the dictionary, Diderot and D'Alembert made their encyclopedia alphabetical. Older encyclopedias were organized hierarchically and by subject. Theirs was designed to be explored by keyword and to allow readers to enter and to exit at any useful point. Second, the new encyclopedia was hypertexted. Articles were linked through a system of renvoi or cross-references. The encyclopedia also offered a hierarchical subject map echoing the structure of older works, but in the work of Diderot and D'Alembert, the tree of knowledge was presented as one of several possible heuristics. Third, the encyclopedia was illustrated with lavish, highly detailed, and meticulously annotated diagrams illustrating articles at the work and at the same, provide, at the same time providing a visual index. And finally, the new encyclopedia was multiply authored, drawing on writers across many fields. Its authority did not derive from the prestige of a single great mind, but from a socially distributed network. Indeed, a large number of articles in it were unattributed or written under false names. For our purposes, the central defining feature of this new encyclopedia is that it was fundamentally and originally conceptualized as hypertext. 
And here for your consideration is a network diagram displaying the direction and density of just some of the cross-references embedded in the work. The diagram itself is, of course, not an artifact from the 18th century. It was generated by Mark Olson and Gilles Blanchard, researchers at Artful uh, at the University of Chicago, which created an interactive digital version of the Encyclopédie already back in the 1990s at exactly the same time that I was uh, first encountering Ted's books. In this diagram, nodes uh, represent topics identified by Diderot and D'Alembert, and the fatter lines uh, show a higher number of links. There's a great deal to say about the specific features of 18th century thought that are illuminated by Olson and Blanchard's diagrams. But above all, we see clearly that the hierarchical distribution of knowledge, which many have considered para paradigmatic of Enlightenment philosophy, is not only a pale shadow of the complexity that is present in it, but is also a poor representation of what the scholars and the philosophers of the Enlightenment understood themselves to be doing. The encyclopedists employed a system of cross-reference in order to solve a problem related to the actual complexity of knowledge, while at the same time enabling new kinds of inquiry that were hampered by older literary conventions. The encyclopedists understood their project as both urgent and revolutionary. In their view, modern science and philosophy required a new interdisciplinary approach boundaries among the various arts and sciences were collapsing, and continued progress would only be possible with the demolition of disciplines. Though Olson and Blanchard's network diagram would not have been familiar to a generation of encyclopedists, the concepts behind it were. They too were thinking about intellectual phenomena in terms of underlying structures and aggregate relationships. In this chart of biography from 1765, for example, the English scientist and theologian Joseph Priestley, who was also the discoverer of oxygen, a founder of the Unitarian movement, and among the most derided English political radicals of his day, depicted the history of the arts and sciences as an immense river of time carrying along many individual contributors. Let me just take a couple of minutes to explain this wonderful and very historically expressive diagram. In real life, that is to say on paper, <laughs> thank you, the chart of biography is big. It's about three feet long and two feet tall. The bottom edge is a timeline running from 1200 BC to 1800 AD, measured in regular intervals. The chart contains six big horizontal bands. Each one of these is devoted to a category of biographical achievement. The categories themselves are a fascinating artifact of their time, and a good reminder that as many affinities as we may find between our world and that of the 18th century, these were different times. At the top of the chart are the historians, antiquaries, and lawyers. Below them are the orators and critics, then come the artists and poets, the mathematicians and physicians, the divines and metaphysicians, and finally, at the very bottom, the statesmen and warriors. The interior of Priestley's chart is filled to varying densities with about 2,000 solid black uh, horizontal lines that begin and end at the dates of birth and death for the figures depicted in the diagram. Uh, they have dots where there's uh, some uncertainty. Priestley's system is another sort of hypertext, and his discussion of its hypertextual features is explicit. Each of the lifelines on Priestley's chart refers to a particular person, as indicated by the name above it. But given his druthers, Priestley said he would have preferred to have hidden the names. A rollover feature might have worked very nicely. But with the technology of print, Priestley saw no other practical solution than to put the names on the chart in as tiny a font as was legible. As Priestley recognized, the distribution of names into categories was based on his own judgment. His own biography was a great case in point. A great figure in at least three fields of achievement, arguably he could have been placed among the scientists, theologians, or scholars of his time. Still, Priestley ventured that the patterns visible on the chart revealed real historical phenomena, among which he highlighted two. 
and these will bring us back to our main argument and then to Ted. First, Priestley notes a difference between patterns in the fields for the history of art and science compared with those for the history of politics and war. We see this, for example, in the contrast uh, between the range devoted to the mathematicians and physicians, which is to say the scientists, and that devoted to the statesmen and warriors. From the changing densities of achievement displayed in the former, Priestley is able to derive a story of the classical, medieval, and Renaissance periods, and from the latter, nothing. In the realm of politics and war, from the beginning to the end of the historical record, Priestley finds abundance everywhere and no meaningful pattern to change at all. And here's how Priestley puts it, and I'm gonna read the passage because uh, Priestley is always worth quoting. By the several void spaces between groups of great men, and I should say that he does mean men, there are very few women on this chart, between groups of great men, we have a clear idea of the revolutions of all kinds of science from the very origin of it, so that the thin and void places in the chart are in fact no less instructive than the most crowded in giving us an idea of the great interruptions of science and the intervals at which it hath flourished. By contrast, he says, we see no void spaces in the division of statesmen, heroes, and politicians. The world hath never wanted competitors for empire and power, and least of all in those periods in which the sciences and the arts have been most neglected. So this was 1765. I don't actually think we've done much better than Priestley did then. So that's point number one. Um, Priestley's second point, closely related, is that advancement in the arenas of art and science is not only real, it is also finally inevitable. For some in Priestley's period, this idea, the idea of progress, was a matter of faith. Priestley thought it was nothing more than a statistically supported analysis of history. Priestley believed that the largest present impediment to progress in ideas was the cloistering of knowledge within small domains, whether languages, nations, or disciplines. He argued that the chart showed that by the 18th century, all of those barriers were finally falling and that acceleration had become irresistible. And that's what you see with the density at the right-hand side of the chart. And yet, dilemmas remained. As we know so well in our own period, acceleration of information production brings its own problems. And this is precisely why we find in the 18th century such a tremendous diversity of works employing new strategies of data compression and data display, such as the chart of biography and the encyclopedia, which we were looking at before. Now, I don't want to overstate the resemblance between the 18th century moment and our own. There is a resemblance. But what, what matters to me is not the similarity, but the connection. The textual strategies of the 18th century encyclopedia and the display strategies of 18th century infographics are only two examples of a very large set of information tools that we not only use today, but that we think of in their reinvented electronic forms as hallmarks of our own information consciousness. Part of what has always set Ted's work apart, I think, is its sensitivity to such historical predecessors. Ted's has always been a distinctive futurism, rich in appreciation of what works, of what works in traditional information me mechanisms, and yet impatient with dogmatism and with low dimensional approaches to knowledge. For me, the key to Ted's work has always been his aphorism, literature is debugged. The idea, deceptive in its simplicity, is that literature in its most traditional sense embodies and operationalizes any number of systems that may be theoretical, social, linguistic, and above all textual, that whatever else we may say about them, they have proven over the course of centuries functional, durable, and adaptable. In other words, they have worked, which is a good quality in any technology. The notion that an information system we might build today could still be running 300 or more years from now somewhat boggles the mind. 
And yet, this is the case for the printed reference works of which the 18th century encyclopedias and timelines such as we have looked at are great monuments. The notion that literature is debugged then should not be taken to mean that traditional literature or literary systems are problem free. In fact, Ted's books all contain strenuous rejections of received practices, foremost among them that of presenting information in inflexible hierarchical and linear structures. Ted has sometimes grouped these criticisms under a rubric he calls the school problem. The encyclopedists, thinking in parallel terms, called it the problem of scholasticism. For them, as for Ted, Aristotle was one of the principal dragons to slay. The scholastic attitude is sometimes embodied in textual forms, but as the nonlinear and interlinking structure of the 18th century encyclopedia demonstrates, it is in no way inherent to print. As I've already suggested, hypertext alert, there are dozens, even hundreds of examples of traditional textual and diagrammatic forms designed specifically to facilitate nonlinear and non-hierarchical thinking. One might mention, for example, indexes, tables, file cards, and so forth. And of course, contemporary information designers do think about all of these things, and Ted's own efforts to reimagine database design fall into this very category of work. So the phrase, literature is debugged, should not be taken to mean that we cannot improve on old systems, but rather that it is essential to notice how, for better or for worse, old systems function. This is, of course, the sort of thing that a historian is not unhappy to contemplate. There is so much that we can and must take from Ted's writing. For myself, Ted's work functions as an injunction to attend to our information ancestors while not indulging in worship. For humanists in general, I think his work should be an injunction to study old literatures as systems, which is something an encouraging number of humanities scholars are now beginning to do. And I have one last slide. Thanks. Does anyone want to know about old stuff? In real life, yes, I have. The most beautiful copy I know is at the Library Company of Philadelphia, an amazing institution, uh, one of America's first circulating libraries founded by Benjamin Franklin in the 1730s. And if you really want to know what the world was like in the 18th century, go visit the library company because they haven't, ex they haven't uh, accessioned books since then. So you just, you walk in and, and, and sign your name and, and enter the 18th century. And all of the books are there and you can, and you can operate them. It really is, uh, you know, an operating system. Uh, and, and, and you can be there. All of the books are there anything an educated American would have wanted to look at. And, and, and these moments vibrate. You know, this is 1765, and again, to fit your head around this, you have to understand that the line graph is not invented till 1786. So it's 20 years later. So just the, the, very, the very idea of, of the timeline in, in this sense is brand new. And, uh, and it's just as today, it's a response to a real, you know, a real sense that, um, there's so much, there's so much material and there's so much complexity that we need to build new interfaces. And, uh, and as I said in the talk, um, this is the kind of vibration that I feel when I, when I read literary machines. Yeah. yeah. Wendy. Yeah. Uh, it's um, so I have the privilege of being a fellow of the Royal Society and um, as part of that, that was uh, just over 350 years old. 
um, as part of that, you, when you become a fellow, you sign the book that Newton signed and all the founders of the, you actually sign the same book with a quill pen. It's so exciting. It's the same. They had the prescient to build a big enough book in 16 whatever. So there's still room for about a, a third of the book is still empty, right? But the interesting thing is that um, next year is the 350th anniversary of the first, um, their first journal publication, which is why the society was formed. It really transformed yeah. how scientists published their work, because before that, they didn't share their work in that way. Um, so I'm, I've been asked to be on, this is my question, I've been asked to be on the committee that's being formed, as ever, for next year's anniversary of the first uh, philosophical transactions of the Charles society. Oh, hmm? sorry, go ahead. Huh? What? Go ahead. I didn't sorry, get what did you say. Said do it. Oh, you'll do, well, I want your advice. You what I, so what the committee wants to do is say, well, it, it's going to have a year of celebrating journal publishing and thinking about the next 350 years. And what advice would you give the society about what it should be doing to, to build on all these ideas in order to take publishing forward? I'm thinking of the world of data here mm -hmm. as well. There's, it's much more complex going forward even than it was. So um, I'd like some help with what advice I give the committee as to what we do next yeah, for the I'll, next 350 years. You know, it's crazy. I, 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 I'm going to think hard about that, but it, it's crazy to field questions like this with Ted in the room. Um, <laughs> because I, you know, I just want to say... Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, um, I, 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 I think I'd, I'd like to take that as a comment um, and 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 think about and think about the this very important question. I do want to say that um, in terms of the significance of this diagram, um, Priestley, as you know, was a member of the Royal Society. Um, he, he this is this is the this is the discoverer of oxygen. He's inducted into the Royal Society on the basis of the chart, um, not the discovery of oxygen. Yeah, it's before it's before it's before the discovery, but it's the so strength of the chart. My other question to yeah. you is: I've been asked as a council. I'm now on the council of the Royal Society as well. I, if I get involved with anything, I have to end up organising it. So, I'll never be president, though. That's uh, beyond me. But the uh, we've all been asked to be to pick which artifact we want from the Royal Society Library to be photographed with. And I don't know which one to pick. So. And, 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 well, everyone will want that. So Christine's now going to answer the question, because on here she has a picture of the first uh, journal publication. Great. I used this in a talk on Monday. This is a slide I should, should have had in here as well. This is the cover of the first of the Royal Transactions of the Philosophical Society. And this is... Right, and, and this I use as an example of open science because this was the transition yeah. from letters between gentlemen to peer review and open access and exchange of ideas. And so the, the paradox is that 100 years later in the period that I'm talking about, yeah. there's so much of this. The scientific enterprise has become so uh, supercharged that uh, many people are, have the opposite response by the middle of the 18th century, and the question is how to um, push stuff out of the system so that, so that, so that things can be, uh, so that people can actually wrap their heads around it. Well, it's a very different moment. To bring it all back to Ted, which is why we're here, is that his, his uh, ideas are what, well, I mean, we use them to build the open access stuff, and it's what, you know, scientific publishing for the future will be about, as Christine said in her talk. Christine, did you have another question, or was that your, uh... <laughs> No. I do, but I think I'll save it. Okay. <laughs> we, we have lots of other great things. Thank great. you. That was wonderful. Thank you all.